Well, good morning or good afternoon. This is Mr. Kinney. We're going to go over the, the fall semester periodic table test review for 2016, the even problems. We did the odd ones in class. So I'm going to, let me zoom out here. So in this one we're learning about, this unit we're learning about the periodic table and we're really learning how periodic table is set up so that the elements on the left side want to lose electrons. They have very few electrons in their valence shells and they want to get rid of electrons. The nonmetals over here tend to gain electrons to become stable because they all want to end up eventually to be just like the noble gases. That is that they have their outer valence shells totally full. So all of these elements here don't have full valence shells. They're jealous of these noble gases and they try their best to steal, borrow, share to become like those. And in this unit we're learning the periodic table and trends of them. So number two. Now I'm going to zoom in here. Describe Bohr's theory and his model of an atom. Well if we come over here, this is the idea that came up with Bohr. Beforehand they thought okay well once they realized there were electrons on the outside they they didn't they just thought they were kind of randomly going around. Mr. Bohr realized, okay, there's two electrons that are going to be fairly close to the nucleus. Then they'll find there's going to be up to potentially eight electrons that will be in another region, another, and they, they figured out these were energy levels. So what we call shells can also be called orbitals, can also be called energy levels. They're all interactive, but Mr. Bohr is the one that figured out that, hey, they, they tend to be certain distances apart. And so that was his model. Now, they would like us to draw the Bohr model for carbon. Well, carbon has, we're looking on the periodic table now because they didn't give us an isotope, just carbon. It has a total mass of 12. So when we draw its nucleus, we know there has to be 12 particles in there. And for carbon, let's see, six of them are protons, proton six. And since there's a total number of 12 of them in there, it's going to be 12 minus six will be, neutrons will be six. Now carbon is in period two of the periodic table. So that means it's going to have two shells. I'm just going to draw them partially here. We know that there can only be two electrons in the first shell. And there's going to be, the atomic number is six. And that means there's going to be a total of six electrons. So there should be only four electrons left over here. And, and lo and behold, the carbon is in group 14 when you look on your periodic table. So that shouldn't surprise us. Silicon. Okay, so we're doing silicon. So we have to look on the periodic table. Okay, there are 32 particles in the nucleus of silicon. 16 of them are protons. So we'll say 16 are protons. Now to figure out, let's see, since there's 32 total particles in here, 32 minus 16 is going to equal 16. That kind of rhymes. No, not kind of, it's poetic, 16 and 16. Now silicon is in period three of the periodic table, so it's going to have three shells. So I'll draw the shells here. We know it can only have two electrons in the first. The second electron um, orbital layer will fill up with eight. And let's see, eight plus two is 10. So we need six electrons, whoops, six electrons out here. And that kind of makes sense because, um, let's see, where are we? Um, did I do the wrong one? Oh no, I did sulfur, I'm so embarrassed. Okay, um, well, okay, I did sulfur here, okay? Dang it, okay, you needed to do silicon. Oh, what a dork. Okay, so for silicon, sorry. Er, live here, you would have had 14 protons. And let's see, oh, I can't read it on that one. That one's too small. Let's see, we have 28 particles in the nucleus. So 14 minus 28 will be 14 neutrons. Okay, I'm still getting over my blunder before. Now silicon is in period three. So it's gonna have three shells and we'll have two electrons, eight electrons. 2 plus 8 is 10, so we'll have four electrons out there. Now, the reason I knew I was doing the wrong one, because all of a sudden I had six electrons here, and I thought, wait a minute, silicon's in group 14. That was a double check I did, so sorry about getting up, doing the wrong one. 
All right, number four, moving on to um, waves and such. Label the highest, medium, and lowest energy on the diagram. Okay, so where we have the really long wavelengths, okay, really long wavelengths here, that's going to be lower energy, low energy. And then as we get over here, this is high energy, over here, high E. And then this will be middle energy over here. And so the closer together these are, the, the more energy you have, the, it's higher frequency, shorter wavelengths. Now let's see, what else we have to do? Label the high frequency waves and the low frequency, okay? High frequency, because there's a whole bunch of them in a time interval, low frequency. Low frequency. FREQ, we'll abbreviate that. Okay, so next one, C. Okay, so on the flame tester spectrum lab, when light was given off, okay, the photons are pushed up. Let's see, okay, so what's, which of these is correct? I want you to circle the correct one, let's see. So light is given off when an electron is pushed up. No, you don't get light when the energy, electron's being pushed up to a higher level. You get it when it finally runs out of energy, has to fall down, and so nothing happens when it goes up, but when it falls back down, okay, you heard that noise. Well, the noise for light, for, for, these, for atoms, is gonna be light's gonna give off. And D. Label the wave parts. Okay, this is wavelength. Okay, this is a trough. This is a crest. And this is amplitude, which if you're interested in musical instruments, they have like amps, amplifiers. It just makes that larger. So I think that's the parts there. Okay, we're in number six right now. Explain how the number of each subatomic particle is determined for boron and aluminum. Well, I'm just going to do it for one because i got to save time. So the, um, each subatomic particle, protons with a plus charge, electrons with a negative charge, and neutrons with a neutral charge. Now for the element boron, okay, I'm going to look on the periodic table here. Boron, atomic number five. So there's five protons, five electrons. That tells you that right away. Now we've got to do a little bit of math. For boron, the math, uh, the atomic number is, or excuse me, the mass number is, when we look on here, is going to be about 11 because we need to look on here and round the 10.81 to 11. So we'll do 11 minus 5. So we got the atomic weight minus the, the number of protons, and there should be 6 neutrons. You do the same thing for aluminum. I'm not going to do it here. What are isotopes? Isotopes are heavy. I'm abbreviating or light elements. Okay, how do isotopes of an atom differ? Well, for hydrogen, you can have hydrogen one that has only one particle in its nucleus. It only has a proton. You could have hydrogen two. So hydrogen two has a neutron in it here. And then hydrogen three, it has two neutrons. So how do they differ? Everything's the same about them. I mean, they're going to have one electron, one electron, and one electron here. But what's different are the neutrons. The number of neutrons is what differs in isotopes. Why does an atom's mass number that, for example, hydrogen 3, not equal its atomic mass? When you look on the periodic table, it'll say hydrogen is like 1.001 .001 or something like that. This is an average. Can you see that? I didn't go off there. That, oh, sorry. So this is an average when you see that 1.001. .001. When you see hydrogen three, that is specific. That is how many particles are in the nucleus of that atom. The average atomic weight, it's just telling you on average how many they would have. Number 10, how is the modern periodic table arranged? It is by, arranged by atomic number. So it's by atomic number. It gets its funky little shape like this because that's arranged that way. Then the next way they arrange it is by valence. And then they arrange it by also by how many shells it has. But the modern one, the number one factor is atomic number. What particle is most important in, in elements properties? It's gonna be the electrons because they are on the outside making connections. They make bonds. Now, 
you could argue protons attract the electrons. Yeah, that's right. But it's the electrons that are going to really determine how it's going to interact. Let's see. How many shells do elements in the following periods have? Well, period one, one shell. Three shells. If you're in period five, you have five shells. Period seven, you have seven shells or seven orbitals or seven energy levels. That is what is so cool about the periodic table and why it has that look. Whatever horizontal row it's in, that's how many shells you have. Okay, number 12. Where are the following groups of elements on the periodic table located? Well, you know what? You've got this in your notes. You can look in the back of your textbook. They're all labeled, almost all of them are labeled here. I'm not gonna go through every single one of those. You've got those. The only thing I will say in your textbook, this right here, group 17, they don't have it labeled in your textbook. So let me come over here, let me zoom out a little bit. So I will say, these guys are the halogens. But you can look in your notes, you can look in the back of your textbook, because I'm not going to take time to go over that here. That's, that's pretty straightforward. Number 14, which group of elements has full valence shells? Okay, that's going to be group 18. Okay, the noble gases, sometimes called the inert gases because they don't do anything. So that's going to be these guys right there on that part. These are the noble gases, NG. What group contains inert elements? The noble gases. What does inert mean? Stable. Does nothing. Okay, the noble gases do not need anything. They don't need any electrons, so they just mind their own business. Number 16, define atomic radius. Okay, how wide an atom is. Okay, atomic radius. Okay, actually, all right, it's gonna be how wide, um, you know, when you're looking at it, it's gonna be actually this number there, halfway through there, um, from the center of the atom to the outside, but it gives us an indication of how wide the atom is. Ionic radius is the same thing. We just need to know that with, with this is when the atom forms into an ion and metals will get smaller their ionic radius gets smaller. This is metal. And nonmetals, their radius will get actually larger. Nonmetals. Nonmetals. Okay. Um, okay, so ionic radius is just, sorry, it's going to be how wide the atom is once it's ionized. Electronegativity. Electronegativity is a measure of attract, uh, how much it attracts electrons. How much it attracts, it meaning an atom, attracts, sorry, electrons. Ionization energy. This is the energy to remove one electron. So these are similar but a little different. This is how much they want to attract an electron. This is the energy needed to take an electron away. So we'll talk more about that trend in a little bit. Number 18, why does atomic size change the way it does as you go across the periodic table? Well, with atomic radius over here, and I would recommend when you get a graph like this, here's number two, you go through, and there's number 10, you go through and you draw, separate those out. Well, anyway, atomic radius, as we go from one side of a period to the other, they get smaller. So as you go across the periodic table, they're getting smaller. And the reason is, so the question is, why does it do that? For listing number 18, why does atomic size change the way it is? As you move to the right side, the nucleus gets stronger. That's kind of a big one. It gets stronger because you're getting more protons, more plus charges, and those plus charges, they pull electrons, pull electrons in tight, or say tighter. So the more we get towards the right side of the periodic table, the more neutrons we have and the closer it pulls in the electrons that are there. Let's see, number 20, 
What are the trends for electronegativity as you go across or down the periodic table? Um, the trends are going to be as you go across the table this way, the electronegativity gets higher. Electronegativity is the attractiveness gets higher up to the halogens, group 17. Once you get to the halogens, let me zoom out, it drops to zero. So the halogen, after the halogen, so once you get up to the halogens, the uh, electronegativity increases. Which element has the largest value? Fluorine has the highest electronegativity. Oh, as you go down the periodic table, so as you go down the periodic table, the electronegativity gets smaller. It decreases. You go down the table, down the table, E N decreases also. Because the bigger the element is, the more shells they have, it needs electrons less. Okay, 22. What group are the peaks for electronegativity? Okay, here's electronegativity. The, they're the halogens, just as we talked about, halogens. Um, what group are the lows? Okay, the lows down here are going to be the noble gases. I'm going to abbreviate it NG. The noble gases are the lows down there. Number 24, what are the trends for ionization energy as you go across? Okay, it's as you go across the periodic table that way, ionization energy gets higher. It's harder to pull an electron off the closer you get to the nonmetals. As you go down, let's see what it says, as you go across or down, okay, as we go down the periodic table, ionization energy gets smaller. So the lower you get, the smaller. So it turns out, what element has the lowest? It's going to be down here in the bottom left corner, probably cesium or francium. Francium um, doesn't exist very long, so probably cesium, but the bottom left corner would be, the, be that one. Why do ionization energy changes the way they do as you go across or down? Well, as you go to the right, nonmetals need electrons. Oh, need electrons. I'll just use the abbreviation there. Metals don't. Let's see, as you go, why do they go down? And then as you go down the periodic table, okay, if you get further down the periodic table, it takes since you've got more and more and more and more shells, this electron is way easier to pluck off when it's way far away from the nucleus because the nucleus is pulling it in, but when you're way out here, it's really easy to pull it in. 28, how are number of electron shells determined? What period is it in? That's the easiest way. What period is the, ele what period is the element in? How many electron shells do neon and nitrogen have? Well, neon is in, there it is, it's in period two, so it has two. Nitrogen also has two shells because it's also in period two. Number 30. Okay, so we need you to, these are different, uh, this is the isotope form version of filling this out. We wanna know how many neutrons. This is the mass number, so it'll be 16 minus eight. You can do your own math. Okay, this is the mass number, 32 particles in the nucleus, minus 16 of them being protons. You do your own math. Silver is pretty big, 108 particles in the nucleus, minus 47 of them being protons. The answer will be neutrons. 80 particles in the nucleus for bromine, minus 35 of them being protons. Gives you the answer. And for lead, a great big element, has 207 particles in the nucleus, 82 of them are protons. So that can give you your answers. I'm not going to do that here. You can do the math. How, oh, sorry, how, what, okay. So what are the numbers of protons, electrons, and neutrons, and carbon? Okay, let's see. Protons first. Protons and carbon, you look on the periodic table. Carbon's atomic number is six protons. And let's see, how many electrons will it have? Electrons will also be six. And since this is carbon 13, we need to do 13 minus the number of protons, minus six. You can do your own math there, I'm not going to. Let's see, 
For fluorine, fluorine on the periodic table is atomic number nine, so protons will be nine, electrons will be nine, and since this is fluorine 20, there's 20 particles in the nucleus, we need to do 20 minus the number of protons. You can do the math. Beryllium 11, beryllium is atomic number four, so protons are four, electrons are four, and neutrons will be 11 minus four. You can do your own math there. On the back side. Okay, I wanted you to label these. So the first one, this is atomic radius. As we go across a period, so we'll start at group one and end at group 18, what tends to happen with atomic radius is the atoms tend to get smaller. Okay, so as we, if we were to draw this out here, we would say, okay, there's this size and they get smaller, smaller, smallest. They get bigger as we go down. But as you go to the right, they get smaller. As you go down, they get bigger. Ionization energy, the energy to pull an electron. It's really easy to pull an electron off group one, but it's really hard to pull an electron off noble gases. So the graph tends to be like this, it increases. So the highest one is gonna be over here, a big giant ionization energy. As you go down, the ionization energy gets a little smaller and the smallest ionization energy will be right down there, really tiny. Okay, and let's see, electronegativity. It's very similar to this one. Okay, these two are very similar. It's gonna get higher as you go here. This is the ability to attract an electron until you get to group 17. Then it drops to zero at group 18. This is group 17. So what happens is these are all zero, 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 all the noble gases. And then fluorine has the highest one right there. So if I'm gonna draw this, I'm gonna say it's really big. And when you get down to here, um, oh, I don't have my chart. It's something like, it's really small. So the numbers go down to like 0.5 or something like that. All right. Thank you.